ahoy. So I know, I know, I'm probably gonna become the Alpine Linux guy if I keep talking about Alpine Linux, but it's my favorite Linux distribution for a very clear reason. Not because it's the kind of system I'd want to use for development or for daily driving, um, but just because it stands out so much from all the other Linux distributions and it has uh, a few advantages in certain use cases. Um, so as some of you already know, um, it uses Muscle for its C compilation, and it uses BusyBox instead of the GNU utilities, which means that Alpine Linux has a uniquely small footprint. Um, it also means that it's really bad at compilation because it doesn't include a lot of the utilities uh, that GCC uses in order to optimize machine code. So in a sort of contradictory way, yes, it is a lot smaller, it's a lot more efficient, uh, than most other Linux distros, um, but it also has the effect of running Python code 50 times slower. However, we will not be running Python code on Alpine today. Instead, what I'll be doing is uh, something a little bit unique. Uh, for some of you who are more well-versed in Linux and how it is put together, how it works, um, feel free to correct me in the comments because I feel like I'm going to get a ton of this wrong. Um, but for those of you who are sort of dipping your toes in the Linux waters or even feel pretty confident, um, this is going to be an interesting introduction to low-level Linux operations. From the Alpine perspective, I'm going to open up an HTOP window and we're going to slowly disable processes until the system no longer works. And I'm going to explain what those processes are doing in the first place and uh, why I'm choosing which processes I'm going to kill first. So it's going to be kind of fun. Um, this is something I did a few weeks ago just to see what would happen, and I thought this was an excellent uh, but sort of brief learning opportunity. Uh, if you don't know much about Linux, uh, get ready to change that. So as you can see here, um, I have HTOP, which is a, uh, it's sort of like task manager, uh, but for Linux systems. It runs in the terminal, obviously. Um, it's got a beautiful end curses interface. You can see all sorts of statistics about your system. Um, obviously, I've got tons of cores dedicated to this VM, um, and I'm only using about 150 megabytes of RAM. We're going to change that, though. Currently, I've got it ordered so that it's ascending uh, using the PID. And this is so that the processes don't move, so I can talk about them. Um, and we're going to be going top down. I'm going to be explaining just a little bit about what each of these processes is, um, and why some of them aren't going to break the system if I kill them. Now, something to keep in mind is that BusyBox replaces literally hundreds of different utilities um, that GNU provides uh, for most Linux distributions. Um, this doesn't necessarily mean that it's useless. Because it replaces all of these utilities, when you use HTOP on a typical Linux system, you're going to see significantly more processes. Um, That's one of the reasons why I like using Alpine for educational purposes, because of how succinct it is, um, it makes it easier to kind of wrap your head around the whole system. Now obviously, BusyBox is PID1, and it shows up as sbin init in uh, HTOP. If I kill this, the whole system goes down. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna put a pin on that one. Let's move on. Okay. Process number two, or number 1945, depending on what your preference is. Um, UDHCPC, what exactly is this? Well, this is uh, the DHCP client. DHCP stands for, DHCP stands for Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol. I had to look that up because when you're in my field, there are so many acronyms, it's really hard to keep them all straight. Anyway, so uh, this is absolutely required to have a, a TCP IP stack work properly. Um, you can see from the argument here in the command, um, I've obviously got uh, virtual ethernet coming into the machine. Um, if I were to kill this, my internet would stop working. But I don't really need internet, so uh, yeah, let's slice it off. All right, next, syslogd. Syslogd is a daemon. Um, if a program ends with D, typically it's going to be a daemon. Um, we're going to exercise it later. <laughs> All right. So what this is? This is a general system logger. Um, so if you need, um, if if a program wants to write something to the system logs, it'll call this program um, or daemon. Uh, someone's going to get 
hissy in the YouTube comments, so I gotta specify that. I don't see any particular reason to keep it active. Um, so, it goes away. So next we've got ACPID. What is ACPID? Well, um, it is the, let's see where I got that written down, Advanced Configuration and Power Interface. So what this does is this handles um, like your, your, your battery, if this is a laptop, um, it handles how fast your system runs um, compared to what might be a more energy efficient solution if you're on the go. Um, it, it's the program that you access if you want to know how much battery life you have left. Obviously, um, seeing that it has D right there in the name, it is indeed a demon, and you know what we do to demons. I don't particularly need to know how much battery life I have on this uh, desktop system. Next, we've got Cron. Now this is a fun one. Um, I have a very soft spot in my heart for Cron. It's been very useful, very kind to me uh, for work, setting up automatic emailers. It is a utility that actually dates back to the Bell Labs um, era of Unix history. In fact, uh, the Cron utility itself dates back to 1975, making it as old as my parents. Of course, I don't have any Cron jobs running at the moment. Um, I don't see any reason to. So uh, let's cancel that and look at that. We've already saved like a whole megabyte of RAM. We're seriously deep loading the system. It's gonna run so fast once I'm done. So next we've got um, the Network Time Protocol Daemon, NTPD. Um, this is also something that dates back to the uh, Unix era. It's required in order to keep your system time synchronized with internet time servers, um, which is very important for many tasks. Probably the most important one being um, HTTPS. It's very important to know what your system time and date is uh, for you to be able to uh, authenticate certificates. And obviously this isn't what it was used for when it was first written, but I mean, it's a computer. If you got a clock, might as well have a demon controlling it. And I mean, if you're a BSD fan, then everything on the computer is controlled by a demon. So, you know, I think I've got a crucifix in here somewhere. I've said this twice before and I'm gonna say it again. You know what we do to demons. And you're gone. Okay, but anyway, more seriously, um, this application is fairly standard um, on Linux systems, but the implementation is handled differently depending on what system you have. Um, so if you have a Sys5 init, uh, which is heavily inspired by uh, Unix System 5's init system, obviously, um, it's gonna work a little, this, this particular binary location is gonna work a little differently than if you have OpenRC or System D. Um, so this right here is actually a Getty instance um, that was started by OpenRC. Now, uh, logging into your system looks a little differently depending on what kind of system you're using, what kind of um, initialization structure you have. Um, you see, back in the day, back in the Unix era, uh, you basically had a folder with a bunch of initialization scripts. Um, even into the Linux era, uh, that was how um, initialization was done for a long time. Um, and then system D came around and completely swallowed up every single distribution, save for Gen 2, bless them. You see, um, system D is a little bit controversial and is definitely warranting a video. I don't know if I can do it justice though. Um, there are probably plenty of great system D videos out there that could do a way better job than I could, but it's worth a watch. If you need something to watch, and you want to learn a little bit more about Linux and the absolute insanity of the people who use it, <laughs> uh, look up System D. It's pop some popcorn. It's worth it. Um, but anyway, for Alpine, um, they use OpenRC, uh, which is made by the Gen 2 team. And what it does is it starts Getty instances. And we'll get into that a little bit more. Um, if I were to close this application, it would log me out and probably restart the system. Um, and for that reason, I think it might be the first thing that I kill once I get to the end of this list. Um, but we're gonna, we're gonna put a pin on that. 
So something that I found to be interesting um, that a lot of people who used computers, like MS-DOS computers back in the day, um, or only just getting started with the command line don't understand is that uh, Linux, I mean, obviously there are ways to interact with your, your, your system from a kernel level, but its architecture is fundamentally Unix-like. Unix was designed to be a central mainframe that was then accessed by terminals. Um, so you're not going to be using the actual, like there isn't a screen on the mainframe um, to access uh, applications. You're going to want to use a separate terminal which then communicates over a network with the uh, mainframe computer. So what essentially this computer is doing, um, as all Linux-based systems do, is it a sort of a uh, server client model uh, where uh, G-E-T-T-Y, um, which is how you're supposed to pronounce it, but I, I can't help it look, it looks like Getty, I gotta say Getty. It's like screaming at me. I hear its sweet voice singing into my ears as I try to go to sleep. And um, that's actually the reason why when you are configuring Getty, which is a terminal application, um, you can control the baud speed um, because essentially it's acting as if it were over a network. Um, so you, you'll notice that there are six different instances of this um, and you can alternate between them by using the, not that key, go back. And you, if you didn't already know this, um, you can alternate between these TTY instances uh, using uh, Control Alt and then the F keys. So if I click F2, it takes me to this screen, and I can actually like, I can go through all six of them. Um, you could do this on just about any Linux system. In fact, if you're running something like Ubuntu, um, you don't believe me, try it out. It's a lot of fun. Anyway, much like um, the affection from another human being. I don't need these. Um, I'm I'm just fine. I'm just fine without these uh, these TTY uh, these TTY instances. You see, unfortunately, OpenRC uh, will recreate these every time you try to close them. Um, however, you can actually go into OpenRC settings and eliminate uh, these from opening by just commenting out the line that creates them. Um, I knew that, but I forgot it. I'm blaming you guys. Anyway, so we are getting up to ASH. This is a shell application um, because obviously, uh, just because you have a terminal, it doesn't necessarily know what your shell is going to be. ASH is what Alpine uses. Um, I believe the default in macOS is actually ZSH. Um, but Bash um, was used, it wasn't used on macOS for a while. It's used on just about every major Linux distribution. I love Bash personally. Uh, it, it's, it's my favorite, um, not because it's the best, but just because it's the one that I know the best. Um, although I will hold my nose and use ZSH if I have to. I'm not gonna close this because obviously having the kernel um, having a terminal application to then access the kernel and then having a shell application running on the kernel is absolutely essential for the system to be um, usable. So I'm not going to be closing that. And then obviously HTOP is not required. That's the program we're using right now to view all the other processes. So what do we got? Um, we have not saved any RAM. I feel like I've, I've basically like taken away everything in the system that makes it usable, and I haven't even saved a single megabyte of RAM. Crap. Okay, you know what? Screw this. Um, as promised, let's kill this one first. Oh, did it just lock me out? Okay, um, well that was fun. Okay, let's try this again. Okay, we're back. <laughs> All right, so that's what happens when you kill that. Um, let's kill ASH. Apparently I can't do that. <laughs> 
Okay, and then finally, finally, let's kill Busy Box. And there you have it. <laughs> it literally went to a black screen. Man. You know, I was kind of expecting it to be a little bit, uh, a little bit more anticlimactic, like the system was just going to halt. But uh, we even got like a little closing message from open our seat. So polite. Man, I'm so proud of you, VM. You were a trooper. All right. With that said, that is what happens when you uh, dismember an Alpine Linux uh, VM process by process just to see what would happen. I hope you've learned a little bit about how uh, the Linux system works. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to leave those below. Um, if you have any comments on how horribly, horrendously, disgustingly wrong I was about something, which I almost certainly was, I am begging you to leave that in the comments because I genuinely want to learn. Um, if you are not subscribed, I'm going to be making videos like this more often. Uh, this is not my main channel. I just dump my tech stuff on here so that people don't get annoyed by it. Um, but I will start to produce more videos if people are interested in this kind of stuff, you know? Um, also feel free to like or dislike, um, not just the button below, but I will have a pinned comment below. And uh, if you do both, uh, you can now visibly see the dislike amount. Screw you, YouTube still kind of frustrated about the whole dislike thing and that's what I do to cope. Anyway, I hope you have a great day. Um, it was a lot of fun uh, destroying the system with you and uh, it's something I recommend uh, if you haven't done before. Um, doing crazy stuff like this, messing with Linux in a VM, is the best way to learn um, how Linux works. Well, I literally have nothing else to say so adieu.